Chapter 12 Hours before the dance, Felicité came in search of Miriam. Come, she ordered. You see, Lucy, dress my hair now, and while it's being done, one of the other maids can do yours too. My mom says it is not necessary, but she needn't know till it is all done. You mean powdered? asked Miriam doubtfully. Of course. Every lady there will have her hair powdered, and I'll give you some cream and powder for your face, and a tiny beauty spot to put right there. Felicite's silvery laugh broke out at Miriam's uncertainty. What are you afraid of, silly? We will make you look just beautiful. Can Hortense be the one to help me? Hortense? But she's a little simpleton, a habitant. What would she know about doing hair? Maman's maids would train in Paris. Come, we can watch each other in the mirror. So Miriam sat for the first time for the elaborate toilette she had often watched Felicité undergo. It was more torture than delight. Seemingly for hours she held her head rigid and followed in the mirror the deft fingers of the maid. The curling iron hissed and steamed as the heavy red hair was massed high on her head in countless curls and twists. Miriam's back and neck ached long before the intricate creation was finished to Felicité's satisfaction. Then the maid brought the quail pipe and Miriam covered her eyes while the white powder was blown into the red curls. Finally, there was a perfumed cream for her cheeks, powder, and a touch of rouge, and the little black beauty spot which Felicité herself insisted on pasting just beneath her left eye. When Miriam returned to her room, Susanna was already dressed, sitting at the desk writing the daily letter that would never reach James, as though this were an ordinary evening. The startled eyes she lifted to Miriam were disconcerting. Felicité says to come quickly. Miriam hurried to say, "'There's still time to fix your hair, too.' "'Thank you,' answered Susanna. "'My hair is already done.' It lay against her head in two smooth, dark wings, and was coiled in a neat bun at the back of her neck. "'You can't leave it like that!' Miriam's exasperation flared. "'After I worked so hard, you won't look like the others.' Susanna stood up from the desk slowly. "'I am not like the others,' she said quietly. "'I am an Englishwoman.' I have done my hair like this all my life, and I have no intention of doing it any differently. The rebuke in Susanna's voice was too much for Miriam to bear. Furious tears threatened the powder and rouge. Oh, go ahead, then, she stormed. Look like a habitant. It is all right for you to throw away your chances, but I'm young and I know what I want. What do you want? I want to be a part of life, not forever waiting and looking on at other people. I want to wear clothes that I can be proud of, and I want— Oh, stop hatchling me! It is almost time to go, and I have to get my dress on. Susanna started to reply, and then abruptly changed her mind. She stepped forward and silently eased Miriam's dress off her shoulders so as not to disturb the glistening structure. Miriam, somewhat mollified, accepted the gesture as a peace offering. There was no time now for argument or even for thinking. Susanna held the yellow gown for Miriam to step into and bent to adjust the intricate fastenings. Then she stepped back to inspect her younger sister. Of course. They say the English ladies in Boston powder their hair, she conceded. You are a picture, Miriam, I declare. You take my breath away. Miriam felt a rush of gratitude. Don't mind the things I said, Susanna, she returned generously. You look beautiful, really, just the way you are. And all at once, looking at her sister in the perfectly fitting red silk, Miriam realized that it was actually true. What was there about Susanna that, standing there so plain and severe, without knowing or caring, she had a beauty not one of them could touch. For an instant a hint of misgiving quivered in Miriam's mind. She whirled anxiously to the mirror, and there found the reassurance she needed. Yes, the girl in the mirror was everything she had ever dreamed or longed for. The dreams that had begun that October morning in Felicite's borrowed gown had all come true at last. They will be waiting for us, she murmured, embarrassed lest Susanna read her mind. So the two Willard sisters, each unshaken in her own choice, but united once more in affection, linked arms, and went down the stairs together. Felicite was standing in the middle of the hall, a pink and white confection. Even more flattering than the mirror was the astonishment that rounded the little red cupid's bow of her lips. Miriam, your dress! What did you do to it? Isn't it beautiful, Maman? Would you ever dream it was my last year's second best? Madame did not bother to answer. Ice-blue eyes narrowed as she studied the two Englishwomen, taking in every detail, dwelling thoughtfully on the folds that had been gathered so carefully to reveal Miriam's neck and shoulders. Finally she turned to her daughter. "'I forgot something, Felicité,' she said airily. "'You look a little plain in that dress, 
I think you may wear the necklace tonight. Mama, grant me his necklace. With a torrent of endearments, Felicite threw herself at her mother in an ecstatic embrace that threatened to undo all the labor of the Parisian maid. Madame gave her an impatient push. The necklace was brought, lifted reverently from its blue velvet box, and fastened about the girl's plump white throat. Felicite, who had looked anything but plain before, was now positively dazzling. Miriam gasped. Conscious of her own bare throat and arms, she glanced at Susanna. Her sister's lips twitched ever so slightly, and in Susanna's dark eyes, Miriam surprised a gleam of something that was certainly not envy. From the moment they left the carriage and stepped out of the snowy street into the brilliantly lighted ballroom of the governor's mansion, Miriam drifted in a dream world, apart from any reality she had ever known. Under crystal chandeliers ablaze with candles, across a shining floor bordered by velvet hangings, dream figures wheeled to the heart-catching music of violins. Women in flower-like satins and frothy lace rested their hands delicately on gold-braided shoulders. The very air she breathed was perfumed and intoxicating. Nothing that happened in this dream world was improbable. It was not unbelievable that Monsieur de Crest, who had barely nodded good morning for weeks, should bow low to kiss Susanna's hand, and then her own, nor that strange young men should click their heels and offer their arms for one dance after another. It seemed altogether natural that her feet should move of their own volition in the steps that Felicite had coached, that she herself, so intriguingly different from the others, so blazingly alive and radiant, was a phenomenon in this place. She did not stop to reason. The admiration made her light-headed, as though she had tasted the wine Susanna had forbidden her to touch. She forgot Felicite and Madame Ducrest, forgot that these people were enemies and that she was a prisoner. She even forgot Susanna, who, refusing to dance, was still surrounded in spite of herself by a small court of admirers. She could not even be surprised when she tilted back her head as an especially tall young man was presented and looked straight into the bold black eyes she had never forgotten. He cannot possibly recognize me now, she thought, preening herself as his arm encircled her waist and they moved across the floor. But Pierre La Roche's first words were shattering. I see the girl who can run like an Indian can dance as well, he said and laughed to see the blood rush into her cheeks. "'I can't fancy what you can be talking about,' Miriam attempted, in Madame's best manner. "'Oh, yes, you can,' he chuckled. "'You were not so high and mighty when you throw into that soldier like a little wild cat.' "'Tis unfair of you to remember that,' Miriam protested. "'I'm not in the least that sort of person, actually.' "'No? They are changing you fast, I can see that. What a pity about your hair. A crime to put out those lovely flames with a mess of powder.' His fingers rested lightly against the white curls. Miriam did not know how to deal with such conversation. "'How do you come to be here?' she asked hurriedly. "'They said you were a courrier des bois. "'So you inquired about me?' "'I—I I remember that someone spoke of it. "'I thought that all the couriers were gone in the winter. "'Take a good look at me. "'Do I look like a courrier? "'You have failed to notice my new uniform.' "'Indeed, now that she ventured to look straight at him, she recognized the white coat with its brilliant facings and the gold insignia of an officer. I have joined the forces of His Majesty for one year only. I am no soldier, you understand. King Louis is welcome to settle his wars without me. But when the English interfere with my business, that is another matter. He ignored the stiffening of the yellow satin back against his hand. My mother, bless her soul, thinks I am prepared to settle down at last and be a gentleman. But she is mistaken. No honest courier can stay harnessed for long. One year I've promised her till we get rid of the English who are moving in on our good beaver land. What makes you so sure you can accomplish that in one year? Miriam could not resist scoffing. Ha! Less than that, perhaps. Do you think any French soldier is not a match for at least three Englishmen? And when the courrier de Bois lend a hand, poof! The war is as good as over. You take a great deal for granted. You may get a surprise, said Miriam, her temper rising. But who is to surprise us? A handful of yokels who don't even have uniforms to wear? It would be like going out to flash an army of woodchucks. How dare you! Miriam flashed, her pride finally stung out of hiding. Let me go at once. I will not listen to such talk. Pierre threw back his head and laughed so boisterously that other dancers turned their heads to stare. Tiens, he conceded. No doubt the English are heroes to a man. I merely wanted to see behind that disguise of yours. There is plenty of wildcats still left. Now that I'm sure of it, you need not have your eye on any more partners. Now you will have supper with me. Uniform or not, I am still a courier, 
and I enjoy eating with savages. Desire will have her hair powdered, and I'll give you some cream and powder for your face, and a tiny beauty spot to put right there. Felicite's silvery laugh broke out at Miriam's uncertainty. What are you afraid of, silly? We will make you look just beautiful. Can Hortense be the one to help me? She ordered. You see, let's dress my hair now, and while it's being done, one of the other maids can do yours too. My mom says it is not necessary, but she needn't know till it is all done. You mean, powdered? asked Miriam doubtfully. Of course, every lady. Hortense? But she's a little simpleton, a habitant. How would she know about doing hair? Maman's maids were drained in Berry. Come, we can watch each other in the mirror. So Miriam sat for the first time for the elaborate toilette she had often watched Felicite undergo. Chapter 12 Hours before the dance, Felicite came in search of Miriam. Go! It was more torture than delight. Seemingly for hours she held her head rigid and followed in the mirror the deft fingers of the maid. The curling iron hissed and steamed as the heavy red hair was massed high on her head in countless curls and twists. Miriam's back and neck 